Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening uh, and apologies for the slight delay in starting uh, the presentation tonight. We've had some te technical difficulties. Uh, we're just waiting for uh, another of our speakers to join us uh, before beginning the presentation. Um, but while we're waiting uh, for Simon, uh, welcome everyone. Good evening um, and welcome to another Angling Trust Virtual Sea Angling Forum. Uh, my name's Hannah Rudd um, and I'm the Policy and Advocacy Manager at the Angling Trust. Uh, thank you very much for, for your time this evening. Uh, so I'm joined tonight by some of our collaborators and partners on an exciting new fisheries industry science partnership project about Pollock. Uh, so tonight we have Dr Tom Stamp from Plymouth University uh, and hopefully soon we'll also have Dr Tom, Simon Thomas from the University of York uh, and we also have Becky Nesbitt in the background as well who is um, the project manager uh, for the FIST project. So thank you very much uh, for your time uh, to everyone this evening. Um, so the intention for this evening is to provide an overview of Pollock FISP to date and the aims of the project, as well as giving you an opportunity to ask the project team um, any questions and to share your views uh, if you have any on Pollock. Tom and Simon will both deliver short presentations and this will take approximately 20 to 30 minutes and then we'll open the floor to comments and a discussion. So please feel free to make use of the chat box and we'll get to these questions when the time comes. Alternatively, you can raise your hand and similarly, when the time comes, we will provide you with the opportunity to share your views. By joining this meeting tonight, you consent to it being recorded and made available at a future date on the Angling Trust YouTube channel. Um, so if you, you don't want to, to be seen or to be heard uh, in the recording, um, we respectfully ask that you uh, ask any questions in the chat box rather than, than raising your hand, because those, those will be included within, within the recording. Um, so is Simon here yet? I don't think he is. So if you don't mind, Tom, are you able to give a, a quick overview? Um, before I before I hand over to you, um, I would just like to to thank um, yourself uh, as Simon, our project partners, and, and most importantly the consortium of skippers who are operating in the southwest, uh, who are collaborating with us on this much needed project. I think this project so far has been a really fantastic example of angling interests collaborating with scientists in an equal partnership to learn more about a recreationally important species that's very poorly understood. Uh, and to also amplify uh, the integral role anglers and skippers play as, as eyes and ears for our seas. So, so thank you everyone for your time and, and, and making this happen. So I actually think Simon's joined us. T Tom, is that right? I think. <laughs> Perfect timing. Um, let's just see if he is available to, um, to speak. Simon, can you turn your camera on and unmute? You should be able to. Yeah, um... you should have got me now. Perfect. Um, just checking that you've got presenter privileges. Um, cool. Over to you, Simon. Um, thank you. Right. We're not actually on the first page of my talk, but can we go back to that? OK, um, yeah, this is an introduction to the FIS Pollock project we've been involved with. Um, it started off without any funding in 2022. Uh, and it was a collaboration between myself, uh, uh, Dave Uren, and 12 other charter skippers. Um, the reasoning behind it was that there was considered to be a decline in pollock catches in the West English Channel. Now, I'm not saying there's a decline in stock. I was just saying there was a perception that, that there was um, a decline in catches. At the time, pollock are really understudied. Um, there is very little known about them and what like limited data of known was really um, just uh, commercial catches and or um, sampling events from boats and things. So the assessments possible weren't what we call gold standard. Um, we were lucky enough last year we managed to combine with the data um, with the acoustic tagging project from Plymouth to create a fist bid. And actually, what we are aiming to do is to produce some gold standard data um, based on recreational catches, but the same will apply for commercial catches. And it's from an area between Weymouth and Land's End, and it stretches all the way out to well, as far as Area uh, 7E does, which is practically the Channel Islands. Um, we are very lucky that the skippers we work with are incredibly dedicated and. Um, so far, the results are looking really promising. What this isn't is anything to do with the ICs, um, 
the latest IC stock assessment and advice for a zero tack in the English Channel. Now, um, that is done before we actually started this project, and it was based on existing data, um, which wasn't of the best quality, but was of the best, the quality that they could use, the only data they really had to use to get the, the information. Um, just to, uh, I went up yesterday with Andy Howell and had one of the best days inshore reef pollocking I've ever had. Um, and it reminded me of an awful lot of years ago when I used to commercially fish out of Falmouth. Um, we used to drive over that area um, to actually actually catch fish on the wrecks. Um, now that told me two things. First of all, you should never assume that um, there aren't fish that you're driving over the top of. But also that just because you see fish in one area doesn't mean there are fish in others, or it doesn't mean that, you know, if you see nothing, it doesn't mean fish that there, you know, there aren't fish in other areas. Um, it's very much fish move. Uh, fish are movements and numbers are controlled by such things as climate, as well as things like fishing pressure. Now, I'm at heart an ecologist, so I'm very much aware of those different factors. Um, the basic fisheries models rely on things remain, remaining constant over a period of time, and this might not always be true. Um, anyway, I'm very pleased to um, then hand over to Tom, who was actually going to do some stuff about the tracking data. Now, the reason tracking data is so important is we know nothing about movements of pollock, and this is the first time anyone's made any attempts to actually look for them. So go for it, Tom. Thanks, Simon. Um... I'm just going to share my screen. Is that coming through now, Hannah? It is. Thanks, Tom. Brilliant. OK, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. So for those of you who haven't met before, my name is uh, Tom Stamp and I'm a, a researcher from Plymouth University. Um, and I work within a within a much wider team of other researchers that all really focus on uh, tagging and tracking the movement of fish, um, mainly across the English Channel. So while I am presenting this today, it really is um, a real group effort, and um, we are all just one big one big team. Um, okay, so get this to. OK, so tracking tracking animals, just go quickly go over like how we actually track an animal um, and why it's different to what you might how you might track an animal on land. Um, so when you're when you're tracking things like uh, birds or mammals, you might attach a thing like a, uh, called a GPS tracker. Um, and basically this relies on uh, the tag um, either receiving, receiving or sending signals up to satellites via radio radio trans transmissions. Um, and while that worked really well on animals in land, um, as soon as the animals start going underwater, these radio signals don't penetrate very deep. And so you can't really rely on the same techniques to to track these animals. Um, so what we rely on mainly is a technique called acoustic telemetry. And instead of uh, tags emitting uh, radio waves, uh, they emit sound um, and these these tags basically are either attached to or implanted within an animal and they basically just emit a constant um, acoustic signal um, so it emits a signal every one to four minutes over a period of uh, two to three years um, and we then deploy our own versions of satellites along the seabed uh, which we call receivers which can detect these pings and they record the time of day that they picked up these animals making these movements and um, on the top top left of the slide I've got a, a picture of uh, a tag which goes inside the animal um, so that's um, basically like an oversized tic tac um, and then on the top right I've got a picture of a receiver that we that we deploy um, so why why would you uh, want to track uh, Pollock? Um, so as Simon mentioned, there was this sort of perceived decline in Pollock uh, Pollock catches within the southwest. Um, and actually, when we started looking into this for the uh, fist bid that Simon mentioned, um, we realised that it, in, within the IC's advice, there'd been a um, an estimated seventy percent decline in um, pollock across uh, the southwest region over the last twenty years. And one of the potential questions that could be asked by this is that is this is this decline in pollock 
just simply the fact that the fish might be leaving the area and they might be migrating away. And that's one of the reasons why you might want to track these track these animals to try and really identify these um, these questions. OK, so um, I mentioned that we we use receivers to track these animals um, and we now have quite an extensive network of these receivers across the southwest. Um, so each gold point is where we've deployed our receivers. So we've got about, um, I think, about 50 of these units deployed at a variety of um, inshore sites around sort of um, bay embayments, uh, rocky reefs, shipwrecks. Um, and we really try and uh, place these receivers at locations where um, we've been told that pollock are likely to turn up or um, but as a result of some kind of interest from um, organisations like the um, Regional Fisheries Authority or Natural England. Um, this network of receivers that we deploy across the southwest is combined with our much larger system that we that we've been deploying over the last two years. So as I say, the, the gold receivers are the ones that we've deployed over the last two years as part of a project called Fish Intel. Um, and this sits within a much larger system of receivers, uh, which are highlighted in purple. Um, and um, by collaborating with researchers across Europe, we can uh, track animal movement across much bigger scales than we could possibly manage on our own. Um, and this, this initiative is called the European Tracking Network. Um, and over the past years, we, we're not just working with, on pollock, but we're also working on species like bass. And we have used this system to track um, their long range migrations. So um, I've got a black line there on the top plot. Um, and that is actually a real track of um, a bass that we we tagged um, in. Uh, I think we tagged that one in Sussex. It then moved over to Belgium and then back to Devon and then back to Sussex again. So it just shows you the power of this kind of technique to track these long range movements. Right now back to Pollock. Um, so um, we started uh, tagging Pollock um, last year. And um, as I'm sure a lot of the members of the audience will realise, the pollock are really susceptible to the effects of barotrauma. Um, so I, um, I took this, this picture from um, a slide in the States where um, basically it just demonstrates that when fish are caught in deep water, so around 120 feet, um, and they get brought to the surface, the gas inside their swim bladder will rapidly inflate and it has nowhere to go. Um, and that that results in the fish being really blown when they come to the surface um, and they can have quite severe um, uh, physical symptoms, which mean that they might die if we don't if we don't deal with this issue immediately. And so um, in order to track Pollock, we've had to go down quite an elaborate route of figuring out how figuring out how best to uh, mitigate this this barotrauma um, so that we can uh, catch tag and then release fish safely and they can give us lots of lovely data on how these animals are migrating and behaving within within the southwest. Um, and um, one of the main methods that is really advocated within um, the literature is using what's called um, a descending device, which is where you bring the fish up, you do what you need to do to it really, really quickly, minimise the impact on that animal, and then you use some kind of weighted enclosure to take that fish back down to its capture depth where it can recompress naturally without any need of any sort of um, um, real sort of physical interventions to try and release that pressure. Um, and our, our version of doing that is we use um, a cage. So we bring, as I say, we bring the fish up, we tag the fish, which is sort of mini operation. Uh, the fish is only held at the surface for two minutes. We then take, put the fish back in the cage and that goes back down to depth. And then we monitor the recovery of this fish uh, remotely using a, a live feed camera. And only when that animal um, achieves um, full recovery, we then release it. Um, and I've just got some videos here of Pollock um, recovering from this from this procedure. So this cage is down at about 35, 40 meters, and this is a fish just coming around from the procedure. Um, and usually, usually it takes the fish um, a couple of minutes to sort of acclimate to, to what's gone on to them. Um, and then we do get them behaving like this in the cage quite regularly. Um, and sometimes they can be quite aggressive and they really, really want to get out. There we go. OK, so once we're once we're convinced that that fish is now swimming around of its own free will, uh, we then open the bottom of the cage up using what's called an acoustic release mechanism. Uh, so that's the cage door open and then you should start seeing the swip the fish. Swim off. 
Now, once the fish has been released, um, that tag, as I say, is just emitting a constant signal. And as that animal swims around, we then we then pick up that that data. Um, we have also tried this on other species. Um, so this is a video of a of a bass that we tagged. Sorry about the noise. Because it's swimming off. Um, and this this really shows that um, unless this is it, this method has been really successful in releasing these fish um, and without using this kind of uh, method to release the fish back at depth, um, they they quite often can't get down on their own will and they quite often just get attacked by the birds. Um, and so we really do need to use these kind of methods to get these fish back down to the depth in which they were caught. And so we can kind of try and minimize the um, the effects of this this barotrauma. OK, so um, we only really started using these deep water release methods um, this year. Um, and so and we're only now just starting to get our, our first lump of tracking data back. Um, so um, since uh, January this year, we have we tagged around 48 fish using this this deep water release method. Um, and um, we've now managed to get our receivers back to download the data. And from that, we found that we've got around, we've redetected about half of the fish that we tagged um, about 60,000 times. Um, and this really exciting data is, is one of the first attempts to, to tag and track po Pollock successfully um, using these types of methods. Um, and this is on the right hand side, you've got um, um, a plot which sort of shows the raw output of this sort of tracking work. And basically what you're looking at is e each row represents the sort of uh, detections of individual animals. Um, and whenever an animal is detected by a receiver within our network, you get a point on this plot. Um, and the colour on that plot uh, demonstrates the, the receiver that picked up that animal. And uh, what we're seeing is that um, some of the animals are sticking around, um, so they're detected quite regularly at the same receivers again and again and again. Um, and um, but by no means is this a, uh, a full picture. We really need to get more data. Um, we are actually going out um, on Monday, Tuesday next week to do a further download, and that should really give us a lot more answers to how these fish are behaving and whether they're just sort of moving around locally or whether they are uh, moving over much broader areas. Um, in terms of um, this, is the same data just shown on a map. So um, sorry, it's a bit simplistic, but I've just tried to remove any sort of landmarks to sort of not give away any sort of fishing marks. Um, but the red points on here are where we've caught and released fish. Um, and then the color, the other colored points are uh, receivers that have detected those fish. Um, and it just sort of shows that the fish are moving around, but um, the data at the moment suggests that they're staying within an area of around sort of 50 kilometers. Um, and the important thing to say at this point is that we are working with um, another team in France that have done a similar project um, and their result, they've just done a big download of their data and it seems to suggest the same thing, that the fish are staying very local and stay within an area of around sort of 20 to 50 kilometres. Um, that's that's all from me. Um, if you have any, any questions, I think um, we'll take them at the end. Is that right, Hannah? Yeah. Yep, sorry, yep, yeah, that's right, Tom. Thanks yeah. for your presentation. Okay. Great. I'll just pass over back to Simon now. Hi folks. Yeah, just carry on with where I was actually talking from before. This project was actually initiated by concern from not just charter skippers, but also from commercial skippers in the area. Um, they were mentioning they were seeing declining catches of pollock. And I mean, declining catches don't mean the stock's declining and just mean other things as well. Um, and they asked us to have a look. So very much this project is driven by industry. Um, not only do we work very closely with industry, in fact, we couldn't do the work we could without the amazing work done by the skippers we work with. Um, at the end of the project, we will actually talk to the whole the whole of the interested parties, um, whether it's recreational, commercial, and actually get their view. We will present the data and get their view as to whether and if um, or what any ma management measures should be. So from my point of view, I do things a bit differently. I'm getting very basic data that we lack for the species. 
And to do that, I'm getting um, skippers are actually measuring each fish they catch. Uh, so I get sizes, which are very important. I also um, get catch and effort data, which is vital for actually doing any sort of future stock assessment work. Um, I also look at stomach contents, um, age via collecting um, otoliths. And thanks to Andy and many other skippers, I'm nearly up to my 100 for a year. And again, the the age at length is vital for doing any sort of future stock assessment. And it's it's stuff that is actually lacking for the English Channel. Um, the stomach cont content data is really just interesting to see what the fish are feeding on in different places and different times of the year. Um, but we're also collecting data on whether the fish are actually have any row inside them, both male and female. So I'm sexing fish as well. Um, and combined with the movement data, this should actually give us a reasonable idea of a baseline for what the fish are, or the stock is doing at the moment. As I said before, the recent IC device was actually nothing to do with us. It predated our work and we had no contribution to this. So uh, sorry, but um, that wasn't us. Sorry, next slide, please. Oh. Okay, just some really basic results. Um, so 13 skippers so far have caught 16.7 tonnes of fish. Now that's about 8,612 fish as, in, as of today. Um, mean length of those caught is about just under 55 centimetres, uh, which equates to 3.2 years of age. Um, now that's quite interesting because you go back 3.2 years, we're actually into COVID a year and actually if you look i'll show you some graphs later that suggest that a lot of these fish date from that period we're catching um mean weight is 1.9 kilos uh, for using for those who don't do kilos which i must admit are still thinking pounds and ounces when it comes to the fish so that's about 4.3 pounds so far the uh the 14 skippers have actually done 478 trips and if you work out just the rough value per, tr per trip um, value per kilogram for the commercial fleet, it's about £24.30p, which is a decent amount of money. Now, I'm not saying that commercial, you know, the commercials don't get anywhere near that price, but I'm by no means saying that the commercial fishery isn't valuable. In fact, many of the commercial fishermen rely on pollock for their livelihoods. Uh, the raw catch per unit effort, which is in kilograms per trip, is just under 35, um, 35 kilograms per trip. Now, I've actually done some models which takes into account the variation across the region. So at the moment, I've got very different catches in the east to the west. So we're trying to standardise that to produce one index per year, which actually uh, um, covers the whole region. Um, it's a little bit different. It's a tiny bit higher than that, but not a lot. Um, interestingly, for those who are interested, the catches this year are slightly higher than they were last year, but they're still within the, the in the margin of error, so you can't conclusively say this year is better than last year. Next slide, pl slide please. These are just the distribution of sizes for reef caught and rep caught fish. Actually, surprisingly, the mean size for reef and rep caught isn't that different. Um, roughly the same average size. What I will say is that red caught fish, there's a longer tail on the right hand side. Um, so the really large fish tended to be caught from reefs, from wrecks rather. And anyone who's fished with pollock will know that this is normally the case. Um, what I would say is they were probably seen less of the really large, the double figure fish we used to see from many of the reefs. You know, my diary is going back seven or eight years where 10 pound fish were reasonably common. We haven't seen so many of those in the time we've been doing the project, um, but we, and we haven't seen so many of the big fish out deep either. Um, again, that might just be, you know, uh, as I say, we're collecting baseline data rather than anyone else. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see uh, Bryce Stewart and Hannah holding up some very nice pollock we caught a few months back from uh, from a reef system out of Plymouth. Uh, and we have a very fun day catching pollock and actually extracting the otoliths from them. So those pollock not only um, went to a good scientific home, they also got filleted off and they were my supper. So very nice too. Next slide, please. This is just a breakdown from area. Now, basically 28E4 um, is the far west of the region. So that's around Penzance. Um, 28E6 is actually around the Herds Deeps. Um, 28E7 is actually a bit further up on that line. Um, 
I mean, what you see is in the sizes, you don't see a massive difference. Um, most of the fish were caught from 2095. Um, you can see there it's quite a tight distribution due to the large numbers there. I will say that there were most of the bigger fish were actually caught from the far west of the region or the southern area towards the herds deeps. Um, the 30E7, which is actually the inshore grounds off in Lime Bay, the fish tended to be smaller. Um, now we are seeing it also corresponded with the catch per unit effort. So the catches from that region were less than we were seeing in the west. So whether that's movement or whether that um, actually represents a separate stock, without doing further further um, uh, collections of different data, we really can't know. Now I'm hoping that Tom's data will help us cover some of the movement stuff, but it would be very interesting to see if the stock at Far West is actually genetically similar to that, um, identical to that we get here, or whether there is a separate stock out West. Next slide, please. Again, ages. Now, if you look at these graphs, as I said before, the mean age is about 3.9 years, um, wasn't greatly different from those from the wrecks. But you can see there's there tends to be that tail again with the older fish. Now, pollock will mature around about 50 centimetres. Um, that's about 95% maturity rate, and that equates to about four to five years. So most of the fish we catch are just about mature. Um, again, wrecks much the same, but again, you've got some of these really old fish. I think the oldest fish we got was about 14, 15 years old, something like that. And that re that represents a fish of just over, over 20 pounds. Um, anyone who can remember back in the day, 20 pound fish weren't that uncommon, but there were relatively few seem to be caught this um, now. No, whether that represents we're not going as far because of fuel prices or a real sort of change in the stock, really don't know at the moment. Next slide, please. Catch per unit effort. Now, mean catch per unit effort for the whole time is 34.9 kilo, um, kilograms per trip. So your average angling trip, um, charter trip is catching that. Now, there is a, a big change between um, the months. Now, the peak time for catches was May, and sort of March to May and June represented the sort of start of the reef pollock season off Plymouth. Um, and, and places like Lou. So we did see higher catches associated from that time of year. But some of the, you know, some of the higher, highest catches didn't come from the reef system. They actually came from the wrecks out west. Um, well, the fishing seems to be still very good. And again, we don't really know if that represents um, real changes or sort of a different stock. Um, around about September, um, you know, at October time, we saw a second run of Pollock, and we've seen it both years. Again, that's probably pretty well known. Um, but this year, it seems to be reason not quite as strong as last year. But again, there can be lots of factors to do with this. It could be food availability. It could be the presence of our little um, bluefin tuna friends, or it could be a number of other environmental factors. Uh, the water's actually quite warm still this year, so that may have an influence. But again, I'm speculating. We really don't have the answers up until now. Um, the interesting thing is some of the old traditional months where we used to catch very big numbers of pollock during the spawning season, we're not actually getting that much at the moment. So our, our catch per unit effort in terms of kegs per day was actually lower during that, that breeding season than it probably would have been seen 10 years ago. And again, there weren't as many trips this year, but the weather was terrible. Um, be interesting to see if the weather's better this year, how these figures actually turn out. Next slide, please. Again, this is just a graphical representation of it. And now the black line in the middle represents the median catch per unit effort per month. And the red sort of but the, the red sort of colored in area represents the 95% confidence intervals. Now, now, all that means is that between those two figures, we are 95% sure that the mean is between the two. Um, as you can see during, you know, there are reasonable amounts of doubt in some of these figures, especially sort of during March and during the end of the year, whereas the um, it actually starts to tighten up during May, June, up to, up to September time. And that probably indicates we're pretty close to actually the correct numbers. Um, if you go on to the next slide, 
then you actually see if I can if I can let um, actually put in the number of anglers involved on the boats, we don't really see a pattern at all. But our errors are actually greater. Now, anyone who's actually fished commercially or on a charter boat will realise that there isn't a linear relationship between the number of people fishing and the number of fish caught. Um, you know, a decent commercial boy will catch as many fish with one person as a charter boat will with 10. Um, and part of that's down to skill, um, which is something that's quite difficult to capture in this sort of model. But part of it's due to disturbance. So we all know that if you have you know, eight or 10 anglers on a boat and the shoulder pollock isn't that big, after a few drifts, you actually start to spook them. Um, which is probably something you don't see with one or two rods in the water. Um, is there a pattern in there? Well, you'd be a brave person to say there was. Um, possibly, again, you're seeing the same pattern as you saw before. It just shows that this idea, which is used commonly in um, fisheries, that you should actually take down um, catch per unit effort to the number of anglers, actually, in the case of charter anglers, may, may not be true. You're probably better just looking at, at kilograms per trip. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a summary of the data all the way through. So um, on the left-hand side is the size. So at the bottom of the smaller fish and at the top of the larger fish. And that goes through all the way from the start of this project to now. So again, it shows the sort of paucity of data during the spring um, spawning season, uh, but also the intensity of data during the, sort of May, um, the springtime pollock run on the reefs. Um, interestingly, um, you'll see that there aren't any of those really big fish caught from the reefs. Uh, the two largest fish were both red caught. Um, interestingly, they were both caught in the far west of the season. Um, but most of the other large fish were actually caught from wrecks as well. Um, we saw a big concentration of fish from the reefs, but we didn't necessarily see many large fish. Um, again, it looks from there like, and if you look at the data, there were certainly more fish caught from less trips this year. Again, it's two years data. I wouldn't really draw much from that. Um, the lines, black and the red lines represent the, um, the mean size from wrecks and reefs. So actually you can see they're not that much different. Um, next slide, please. So one of the most important things for a stock assessment is actually the von Burton Lafney constants. Now for Pollock, most of these are actually got from RSC data, which dates back a lot of years. Now, anyone who's fished the area in Wolf Cornwall and the RSC will, will realise there are a lot of Pollock there, but the sizes tend to be small. So it may not it may actually say that a lot of these fish are actually a separate population. So it's very interesting to get these data from. Um, from UK as channel caught fish. Now the date is pretty tight, as can be seen from the lower and the upper confidence intervals on the right hand side. Now L infinity represents the mean maximum size of pollock. Now it doesn't mean it's the biggest pollock you're going to get, it's just the mean maximum size. K is the growth rate, which is actually in years, well, per year. T anchor doesn't really matter either does M fill. Now, M is actually mortality, the natural mortality. So you can get those from the figures above. So the natural mortality is about 2.41 per year. Um, the total mortality from, that was May to May in two years, was 0.616. So roughly 60% of those fish will die, which isn't unexpected. Now, the fishing mortality is about 3, um, 37, uh, 0.375. Um, and that sounds a great, really high. It's not, not actually that high for a fishery. Um, and that will res reflect from um, takings from netting, from charter boats, from, re um, from recreational anglers and from uh, commercial rod and line anglers. Um, again, it's reasonably high, but not exceptionally so. So again, that's quite interesting just from the fish we actually see off Plymouth. Now the next slide, please. This is actually um, from, this is actually taken from Welsh data, and we will be recreating these from the otoliths that we collected from fish caught in the southwest of the UK. Um, so this, this is actually the age of fish got from the otoliths. So if you can see the little dots going down, those are fish showing certain numbers of rings. Um, 
so what this this graph actually shows and it actually is another way of getting the statistics that i showed on the previous image would say that a 50 centimeter fish which is pretty much a spawning shot um, stock would be about four years old so about be around about those ages um it would also suggest that in wales the maximum major fish caught was about 12 years old now we hope to confirm this but we seem to get older fish in the english channel um, we definitely get bigger fish so it would make sense um the fish look slightly faster growing in, in the english channel from here uh, than from wales but again that needs to be confirmed from a, uh, a second year date um, of data i wouldn't say it's particularly much faster growing but they certainly seem to be slightly faster growing than those seen further north um so really we have a combination of things here we, we are collecting very basic data to allow any future work to actually be more accurate um i have no particular interest in blaming one side or another for anything we find we might find nothing you know it's very hard over two to three years to actually say a stock is declining or whether it's increasing but what it does is it gives a really good baseline so which is something that's actually lacking through the, through the english channel so from here on in we may be able to say that the stock is declining or increasing I certainly know, have no truck with any member of the commercial fishery. Um, I've done commercial fishing myself. I know that a lot of people rely on this fish to actually earn a living, and I certainly don't have any problem with recreational fishing. Um, but I'll be very interested to see what the audience actually has to say um, when just shown this data and just, just get some thoughts about what they think is going on. I mean, I will say one thing, um, as an ecologist, when somebody says this caused this, it's very rarely that simple. There are normally a combination of factors that work together, be they temperature, be they um, redistribution of fish due to other reasons, be they fishing mortality from one, one place or another. It's very rarely just one of those. It could just be a really bad recruitment year, um, or it could be a series of bad recruitment years. I mean, that has been seen with bass pre uh, previously. Um, so people will have their ideas about what caused this, but it's very rarely just one of those. So um, I'll be very interested to hear people's ideas. And uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Oh, I have got one more slide, I forgot. This is just the difference between um, percentage mortality um, between males and females, um, sorry, maturity between males and females at different sizes. And they're not much different. So at about 45 centimeters, about half the fish are actually sexually mature. Whereas at 50 centimeters, over 90% are. Um, that's quite surprising that considering the minimum landing size is 30 centimeters. So 30 centimeters, basically you are catching immature fish. It does beg some questions for the future. Now I know most people who will commercially fish for pollock will not catch fish of that, that size. But I have seen recently some of the inshore boys landing some ridiculously small pollock. Um, and you, you have to question really if it's worth the, the, the bother. But it's just worth, worth bearing that in mind. Um, interestingly, the skippers, many of the skippers have instituted now a return policy for all fish caught under 50 centimetres from inshore marks. And actually about 20% 20, 20 of the fish caught, which is about 1.8 tonnes, were actually released alive back into the ocean was something that we very rarely saw before. So with that and the use of descending uh, devices actually indicates that if people don't want to catch, uh, keep fish they catch, we can actually put them back now. So thank you very much. And uh, any questions, please? Thanks, Simon and Tom, uh, for those presentations. Really interesting work that you're you're undertaking. Um, yes, we'd love to invite the audience to either put their hand up and we can give you permission um, to have the floor and, and share your thoughts or uh, ask any questions to our, our panel or alternatively you can put the, the question in the chat and I will read it out for you. So just uh, hopefully we have some questions or thoughts or views from the audience. Um, I can't see any hands up at the moment, but we'll just give you a couple of uh, minutes to, to ponder on what you might be thinking. I can see Bryce Stewart's also joined us as well, who's one of our collaborators on this project. So 
don't know, Bryce, if you've got anything you want to add at any point as well, feel free to unmute yourself. Thanks, Hannah. Yeah, hi, everyone, <laughs> and uh, great talks, um, Tom and Simon. Where are you, Bryce? <laughs> I know, it looks very dark, doesn't it? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, <laughs> put some more lights on. <laughs> this camera's doing weird things. It's a new computer. Looks like you're in a cave. <laughs> Always wanted. Yes. <laughs> it's actually not any better, is it? Oh, well. I am alive. Have we got any questions coming in? Yeah, we have one from uh, Ellie who asks if there's any uh, plans to add some receivers further east um, from from Ben. That question was sorry. Um, sorry. Do you mean do you mean further east of like uh, Sussex, or do you mean further east of the project area? We shall wait clarification. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, if it's further east from the project area, we have we have receivers. Uh, a, a brand new batch of receivers have just gone um, in, which cover from uh, roughly Portland um, all the way to Pool Bay and then around the Isle of Wight. And um, yeah, so there is quite a dense network of receivers in that area now. Um, and that went in over the last year over, as part of another FISP project called Angling for Sustainability. Um, in regards to receivers further east than, say, Selsey Bill, um, at the moment we haven't got any plans to. Um, these units take quite a lot of uh, logistical, there's quite a lot of logistics involved with deploying and then maintaining them. Um, and at the moment, we're, I think we're at sort of full capacity for what we can manage as part of our team. But um, we're always open to hearing um, if there's any other areas that people think might be interesting and uh, we might be able to squeeze out a few more if, if um, people think that would be a good good way to use our resource. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, Ben's just added a clarification that he's a recreational angler based in Sussex um, area at Brighton, and he's also seen a big decline in Pollock where he is. Um, Adrian's added a comment um, and said, is it not clear that the fishing community is shooting itself in the foot by targeting breeding fish when they come into the inshore wrecks, particularly netters? Um, I think that's an interest interesting comment. Uh, any other comments from people? Feel free to share those. Uh, John Locker said, I'm led to believe the receivers for the Pollock tags use the same tags as bream and tuna. Are we able to see any of this information moving forward? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so all the all the uh, acoustic telemetry work that's done in the UK and Europe is uh, works of the same system. And so um, any tags that are deployed can be detected by any receivers and um, the BREAM work is being uh, done by this other FIS project called Angry Sustainability, and they are um, doing some other workshops which will show some of the tracking work from that. Um, I don't have any of it with me now, but um, um, I think they've tagged, I think it was uh, about 200 BREAM this year. Um, so lots of really exciting data to come out of that work. Um, with the tuna, um, again, um, that work is being led by the University of Exeter, um, but um, if there is real interest in it, then I can speak to the um, researchers involved and see if we can produce uh, an output which people can, can view. Cool, thanks Tom. Um, yeah, and just on Angling for Sustainability, uh, the Angling Trust are also a collaborator on that project um, and we've been um, joining for some in-person workshops all around the country and we'll definitely be doing uh, an online forum as well John uh, so people that can't attend those in-person events can also see uh, the outputs and learn more about the project so stay tuned for that one um, and we'll share the date as soon as we've confirmed it. Any further comments or questions? If anyone wants to speak feel free to put your hand up Bryce looks like he wants to speak <laughs> well I'll, yeah gosh you can you can read my body language I have a question for Simon um so setting him up a little bit but um 
obviously the IC stock assessment to date is really just relying on on commercial catches rather than any other index of abundance. So it'd be good to hear from Simon about you know how the data that's being collected through this project differs from that and whether or not it's it should give a better insight into what's going on. Yeah, I mean commercial catch data has an awful lot of problems. Um, it can just reset, um, represent market price. Um, the biggest amount of pollock landed in the UK is as hate bycatch, um, allegedly. Whoops, I didn't say that. Um, but yeah, so it can just represent their setting hate gear in deeper water after the hake. Um, it can just re represent that the price wasn't very good, so they haven't bothered fishing for them. Um, and also, it's it's very much, um, as I said, it's it, it's very much led by issues about reporting. Um, it's it hasn't got any great standardisation, so it's got no effort proportion. Yeah. I mean, for instance, it wouldn't show whether somebody had gone an extra 20, 30 miles to actually look for these fish, or even 50 miles, which may represent actually your, you know, you're actually spending more effort to catch the same amount, which is something that's often seen in stocks that are declining, not saying that Pollock is this declining, you actually see a stability for a number of years past the point when they're declining due to people increasing effort to look after them. And it's one of the ironies that the, um, you know, the less fish landed, the higher the price is. <laughs> So um, yeah, absolutely, can sort of inflate the catches, can't it? Exactly. Yeah. So as I say, I have no feeling about at the moment from our data whether the catch catches are declining over the last few um, years during this project. But there are certainly indications from old logbooks and things that you know you certainly don't see the large fish that they used to. Um, but you still get some large fish. You know, the people who go out yeah. deep are still seeing them. Um, and Pollock are one of those fish that are sort of reasonably deep water and are their range is in you know is will fluctuate with environmental conditions and it's it's also very possible that like cod breeding is actually dependent on temperature um they yeah. certainly spawn at the cold the coldest months of the year so maybe there are some uh, changes in actual breeding location according to temperatures um again it's, it's something that's definitely worth looking at and maybe some of this data will help see it. Yeah, I mean, I think once we get stuck into, you know, processing our own otoliths, we'll get age structures, which will tell us about the strength of different year classes. Um, and we might hopefully be able to relate that to different environmental conditions. So that's that's something I'm definitely looking forward to. And the other thing you just mentioned with the logbook. So, um, if it hasn't already been explained, part of this project is to obviously collect all this data at the moment from charter skippers, but also to look at any historic records that are available. So these can be things like old diaries. We already have access to a few of those and also um, records from angling clubs because some of those go right back to the 1950s. So it doesn't so much give you, um, you know, data on abundance, but it certainly will show you things like changes in the size of, of you know, record catches and things like that. So I think it's really important to try and reconstruct what what things were like in the past to understand better what's going on now. Yeah, and that's certainly a problem because there isn't a baseline. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, we, we have, you look at main, some of the major commercial stocks and they may have baselines going back 100 years, so whereas for Pollock, they don't have it. Mm -hmm. um, so if nothing else, we will recreate a baseline. Yeah. We, There's we've another had a, question in the chat, Hannah. Yes, I was just going to, to mention that. And, and James has also just put his hand up. So first of all, uh, probably a question for you, Simon. And Doug Henderson has asked, has the data on stomach contents produced any interesting results? Um, well, it was, it was interesting. We were presented very early on um, a very eminent scientist claiming that Pollock mainly ate um, annelid worms and crustaceans. Now, I can say we've only found one worm in the stomach content so far. And as most of you would expect, most of the stomachs are full of small pelagic fish. Um, we have seen some salps, interestingly, the, the um, comb jellies. We found some of those in the stomach content recently. Um, and yesterday there was quite a few squid, but mainly it's what you'd expect, small pelagic fish. 
Great, thanks, Simon. Uh, we have uh, James, who's got his hand up. So I'm just going to allow your microphone, James. If you want to unmute yourself, you should now be able to, to speak. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, can I ask where all of this current data that you've already collected has actually come from? Um, what areas? Because from what I have heard, I believe that it's only really come off of boats that generally only sort of fish the inshore reefs, such as Eddystone, Houndsdeep, Phillips, maybe Brendan's Reef. That's my local area. Um, and to be honest, if you are only just going to collect data in that area, then it doesn't really show. I mean, I'm willing to work. I'm a commercial line fisherman, um, and I've also run my father's charter boat, and I've grown up in it, and I've pollock fish all my life. And I just think it's a bit naive if we're only going to take data from one area when a lot of this data, I know for a fact, hasn't come from wrecks down in our area. So, yeah, I just basically want to know is that the only areas that's been collected in the southwest? Because I don't know that Simon's been on boats that will actually go wrecking at a distance as I will. So, yeah, can you answer that, please? Yeah, sure, James. Um, yeah, we have boats all the way from Weymouth to Land's End. Um, I work with boats, some of the Dartmouth boats who fish out by the herds regularly. Um, so it's definitely not just from inshore. And we do actually differentiate between inshore and offshore wrecks. Um, the boats down the west of the region also fish deep water wrecks and some of the Falmouth boats do. So no, we haven't just concentrated on the inshore ones. We do have very good data on the inshore reefs, as you say, but no, we have got a lot of the deep stuff included as well. And it's something we have to be aware of is spatial, is sort of spatial differences. So we've tried to cover everything um, all the way up to Weymouth, but again, it's you, you imagine with the fuel prices at the moment that a lot of the charter boats that used to go out mid channel don't, don't go out there as much, but we've still got reasonable coverage from out deep. Trouble is, Simon, these are the people that are pointing the finger when really every day they're the ones that are out on the same ground, going through the same motions, going through the same routines on whatever tide, and then coming in pointing their finger at the commercial sector, and it's not on because you know, and I know, and, and everybody else knows how good the lures are these days, how good the tackle is. And if you're taking out over six people each day and, and dragging them through all that, the, you know, you are going to do a lot of damage. And they do. But they'll still come in and point the finger at the likes of me and say, I'm doing a lot of damage when I'm single handed fishing. You know, and they, they have no need to be taking out all these fish, yet they still will. And then they wonder why when they go back with the next crowd, oh there's not so many there today and um, yeah and this well this topic to me is, is really frustrating me to be honest yes yeah, back on mate it's your livelihood you know i've been living out of rod and line commercialing before so I'm, i feel your frustration um all i can say is i don't really like pointing fingers at anyone i don't really you know i've never been one to say oh it's all your fault or it's all somebody else's fault and i certainly don't blame the rod and line boys for whatever's going on if anything i mean as you say there may well be you know really good fishing out deep that doesn't necessarily mean you know that the the stock's collapsing or, or whatever I, I mean it's very hard to get a picture from a snapshot so we have tried to include as many as we can um as i say i've got some you know some of the dartmouth boats and some of the other boats that when they go pollocking they go deep but you know you probably do still cover areas that they don't but, you know, your views are really important. Um, you know, at the end of this project, we're going to have a session where we present the data and you get to have your say. And I definitely don't want you not to be included in pass, you know, saying what, if anything, needs to be done about this fishery. It's in nobody's interest. Um, but, you know, it's in nobody's interest to have a collapsing stock, but it's in nobody's interest to have a stock that's stable being said that it's collapsing. So um, I suppose we just got to see what our data will at least provide a baseline. Um, it's it's frustrating that a dis, the IC's decision came out when it did, because as I said, it was nothing to do with us. But yeah, you, you know, you're right. If a boat goes to the same place and catches so many fish all the time and that fish gets less, yeah, duh. 
you know, <laughs> why is that going to happen? It's fairly simple. But yeah, I haven't concentrated. Most of my data comes from um, boats other than those from Plymouth. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Simon. No problem. James. Thanks, James, James, for your comments and, and thanks, Simon. I'm just conscious of time. Um, so if, if you don't mind, I'm just going to move on to the, some of the questions in the chat. But but really interesting discussion. Thank you for, for joining us tonight and, and sharing your views, James. Um, so, so John Locker just asked a question. I think he's referring back to this, the stomach content um, discussion. Uh, so he said, I imagine that data would be skewed as many pollock caught from depth purge their in innards when blowing. Uh, I don't know if you've got some comments on that, Simon, Bryce, Tom. Um, I, I might jump in because I've done a lot of work on this in the past and it's absolutely right. Um, so we're not going to be able to give total figures on, you know, how many prey fish these things are eating. The idea really is to just get a, you know, representative idea of what they're eating in proportion to other species. So, yeah, it's an important point. It happens whenever you take stomach contents in this way. In fact, getting sort of Completely unbiased stomach contents from fish is nearly impossible. Um, if you catch them in a trawl, you have exactly the same problem. The only way I've ever heard of is it's people spear fishing, and even then it happens. So, um, yeah, absolutely. It, 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 we know the limitations, I guess, is all I'm saying. So, thanks. Good, but very good point. Thank, thanks, Bryce. Um, and before we close, we just had. Um, a couple more comments. Um, if anyone's got any last minute uh, things they would like to say, now's, now's the time to pop them in the chat. Um, so Ben's uh, just made a comment that said we had a charter boat going out 25 mile in Feb uh, here, which I think he said he lives around the, the Brighton area to prime Pollock grounds for three Pollock between eight blokes. Something's going wrong hit somewhere. <laughs> Um, and then John Locker has added, uh, bringing up a point that was brought to me to voice here. When these decisions are made, are we taking into account the seal populations in these areas and their effects on the inshore pollock stocks? Seals do not care on MLS and inshore stocks are uh, generally juveniles. Uh, so I don't know if you've got any comments regarding seal predation. It's it's unknown, I would say. Yeah, I, I you know. It's something that may or may not have a big impact, but it's very hard to uh, to guess, really. I mean, I, I will say I've seen bull seals on wrecks that I've never seen bull seals on before in the last few years. But um, if and how much their effect is has never been studied and probably make a very interesting study for someone. Yeah, similar with tuna, I would imagine. Uh, any yeah. apex predator. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I think that's a, a good point to end on. Um, if anyone's got uh, any further comments or questions, please feel free uh, to send them through uh, to us at the Angling Trust and we'll pass them on to the, the, the team um, and, and get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, if anyone that you know was interested in this project and couldn't make it tonight, uh, the recording will be available on the Angling Trust YouTube channel uh, very shortly. So let them know uh, and you can watch this uh, presentation back again if you if you so wish. So thank you so much for your, your support and joining us this evening. Um, and yeah, have a good evening. Thank you very much.